Let's continue with an interesting question I have come across um, on Stack Exchange. And the question is, why is not the answer to all probability questions is uh, one half? And the rationale behind this is, well, you, you must have heard this either as a joke or as a huge mistake that some people make. Okay, let's think about the probability of this event, let's say. Um, well, it either occurs or it doesn't. So it should be one half, okay? So sometimes, as I said, you hear this as a joke, not a good, very good one, apparently, but uh, in some cases, people really do this mistake uh, when the answer is not really very clear. So what, what is the rigorous answer to this? Obviously, even the, the, the person who asks the question is aware that the, the answer to all problem questions is not one half. But how can we articulate the, the actual reason behind this? Um, well, this has to do with how you describe your outcomes. For instance, recall uh, the Dithrow experiment we have just talked about. And let's again ask the question that what the probability is for the outcome three. Now, what we did was, okay, three is one outcome out of six possible. Okay. However, I can also write the possible outcomes, not in this way, but as three and not three. Now, this is what we call sample space. We'll talk about this in a minute, but from a mathematical point of view, these two are both valid sample spaces. They describe the same random experiment, although one of them has more information. And this one, still a valid sample space, but it does not really carry the same information with this one, because the top one, it has all possible outcomes, where um, I, I can assume equal prior probabilities for each outcome. But in this one, I really cannot and not say that the probability of three is one half and the probability of not three is one half. Why? Because intrinsically, I know that this outcome actually comprises multiple implicit outcomes, right? It, this actually involves one, two, four, five, and six. So although classifying the outcomes um, is possible in multiple ways, not all of them is going to give you the same information. Okay, so this is obviously uh, very clear in this toy example, but when you deal with, let's say, real life scenarios, uh, it might be difficult to actually observe this. Are my outcomes equally likely? Sometimes, even if you list all the outcomes um, in, in, in uh, detail, in much, in much detail as possible, uh, even then, it may be the case that your outcomes are not equally probable. So you have to be careful about this. Now, obviously, formulating probabilistic outcomes as, uh, let's say, a outcome A occurs or it does not. As I said, mathematically speaking, this is a valid sample space. However, it's a huge mistake to assign equal probabilities to each of these outcomes. Now let's talk about the concept of sample space in a more detailed way. Essentially, we can define the sample space as the set of all possible outcomes when you perform a random experiment, all possible outcomes. But again, as I said, you can, um, you can have different perspectives on this. So you can uh, actually describe a random experiment using uh, more than one sample spaces. Let's see this on a simple example. Now the coin toss, as I said, you can write the sample space as one, two, three. I'm sorry, this is the coin toss, not the die throw. This is heads and tails, okay? Uh, on the other hand, when you consider a three coin toss, now you can either write this as, let's say, heads, 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 
heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, dot, dot, dot. Let me go to the right. Uh, right at the end, you have tails, tails, tails. You would have eight possible um, uh, orders of outcomes, let's say. So if you care about the order, if you, if you care about the exact pattern, heads and tails, uh, this should be your outcome. However, you can uh, also express the same random experiment using, let's say, three heads, two heads and one tails, one heads and two tails, and three tails. Okay, this is again a valid sample space describing the same random experiment. However, you see um, the amount of information carried in this sample space is now different. Unless you have further information here, you can assume the outcomes in this first sample space are equal probable. All eight of them has one over H probability. On the other hand, if you use this sample space to describe the same random experiment, now you cannot assign equal probabilities to each of these events because you see this one and this one um, include one possible outcome from the first sample space, whereas this one and this one each has implicitly three different scenarios, three different outcomes. Therefore, it would be a mistake to assign equal probabilities, one over four, one over four, to each of these in the second sample space. Okay, so you have to be careful about how you define your sample space because it could affect um, the probability assignment you use to give to those possible outcomes. Now, the die throw, we have talked about this one through six, but again, you can classify this as even odd, okay, or maybe one and not one, right, or um, a prime or not prime, okay, but again, each of those possible sample spaces will carry different types of information, but this one would be the most elementary one that you generally want to work with. Uh, another fine point here that, for instance, with the dice row, you can also use, for instance, this sample space, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, again, this is from a pure mathematical point of view, it's a valid sample space because it includes all possible outcomes. But implicitly, you know that seven is never going to occur, right? You have this information even before you throw the die. Now here, even if you include it in your sample space, you have to assign a zero probability to this outcome. Mathematically, you can see this as an outcome, but you should know that it will never occur. Therefore, you have to assign a zero probability signifying that information. Okay, what else? Let's look at this one, temperature measurement. Um, now, um, this is an interesting example because it depends on how you see this measurement. First of all, you can see this as uh, the, the measurement of the absolute scale. Let's say you are talking about a Kelvin uh, degree measurement. And obviously, uh, the, the lower limit is zero. And the upper limit, well, we don't really have an upper limit. We have maybe practical limits, uh, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, we do not really have a theoretical upper limit for uh, temperature. So we can just use uh, infinity. This could be a valid sample space for a temperature measurement. Now, obviously this is not um, an, an equal probable sample space. Obviously, depending on where you take the measurement, uh, there will be a certain um, region that you, you expect the temperature to be to take, take the value. And another uh, significant point is the nature of this. You see, if you define the sample space as this set, 
this is a continuous set. Now, when you look at this one, this one, this one, even this one, and this one, these are all discrete sets. You can list there each distinct element and you can um, distinguish between them, okay? This is the first one, this is the second one. You can actually list them. They are distinct. And uh, the term we use for such sets is discrete. However, here, this is not a discrete set because, okay, for instance, let's say the first element is zero. That's the smallest element. So let me ask you, what is the next smallest element? You don't know. There is no such thing. There is no next real number after zero. That's the nature of the set. It's a continuous set. So nature, the nature of the set is going to be different than the nature of, for instance, this set. Okay, we are going to talk about these um, in more detail when we discuss discrete random variables versus continuous random variables. Now, on the other hand, let's change our perspective a little bit. And let's say the temperature measurement refers to the value I read on my thermometer. Let's say this is a digital thermometer and it has, let's say I'm taking this measurement on earth. So assuming a reasonable measurement, let's say this is 22.7, okay? Now see, I have one decimal place due to the nature of my measurement device. Now, um, suppose that this corresponds to, in reality, the, the, the measurement corresponds to um, an exact temperature of 22.7128095454, etc. Some Celsius degrees, I don't know. Let's say this is the exact value, but due to the nature of my measurement device, my thermometer, um, it only gives me one decimal place. So the result or the outcome of this random experiment, now the random experiment here is a temperature measurement and the outcome can only take, again, discrete values like 22.7. And the next one, now I can say that is 22.8 because in between, I cannot have an outcome. It will be either 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 or 22.9, etc. So um, the nature of the outcomes is now changed. It's now a discrete sample space. And there is um, a, a big difference between the nature of discrete sample spaces and continuous sample spaces. Census, on the other hand, is by nature, a discrete random experiment, because if you don't know what census means, it's, well, you count the number of people in, in, in a context, okay? So it could be the population of a city, the population of a country, etc. But essentially you are counting people and therefore intrinsically the result of this random experiment uh, would be a, a discrete uh, value. Therefore, this is, um, by nature, um, a discrete random experiment, as opposed to this one. Now, the temperature measurement, as, as we have talked about, depends on the perspective you use, but census, it's uh, by nature, by its nature, it produces a, a discrete uh, outcome. Now, when we say, when we refer to a random event, what we mean mathematically is, a subset of the sample space. So for instance, take the sample space for the dithro, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is my sample space. Now I can define um, any event as a subset of the sample space. For instance, um, all singletons, one, two, three, four, five, six. These are all events. They are outcomes, individual outcomes, but on the other hand, they are also events. And then you have one, two, one, three, one, four, et cetera, let's say up to five, six. These are events with two outcomes. So you can think of all possible 
subsets as random events. Even the empty set, mathematically speaking, is an event because by definition, it's a subset of the sample space.